Video games. How they're made. The people who make them. The stories behind it all. You're listening to Random Access Memories. By Ron's Pies. Enjoy the show. The world you know is coming to an end. The most fortified, bulletproof place in all of existence is now under attack, and your defeat is inevitable. It's over. It's all over. But you're not going to go out without a fight. In a last-ditch effort, you attempt to salvage what you have for the future in a new world, while fighting wave upon wave encroaching on your doorstep. It's an impossible task, but you do it anyway. It's a grisly sight. Your friends have all left, and the people at the top seem to be against you. It's a bloodbath. Depending on your viewpoint or your pre-existing knowledge leading to this episode, I have vaguely described one of two things, the fall of Reach or Bungie as they prepare to ship their final Halo game before venturing out toward unknown horizons. The fall of Reach is an event that has been chronicled ever since the beginning of Halo's story. It's referenced right from the very first game. Master Chief is one of the only remaining Spartan soldiers in the galaxy, shipped away as humanity's last bastion of hope and losing war before stumbling onto a titular Halo ring. It's a bit like Superman when you think about it. Reach is Halo's Krypton, and Master Chief is Halo's Man of Steel. So it was only natural for Bungie themselves to find parallels between their situation at the time and their final efforts for the Halo franchise, a prequel to it all, documenting firsthand the fall of Reach from the soldiers who sacrificed everything for the sake of the future. That fight and that sacrifice were also Bungie's fight and sacrifice, as they were preparing to let go of everything they knew and loved for their future their destiny, if you will. It was a goodbye to Halo, a goodbye to Microsoft, a goodbye to friends and team members, a goodbye to comfort and security. But most of all, it was a sacrifice for the future, for the hope of something greater. Welcome to Random Access Memories, a gaming podcast dedicated to the stories behind video games. This podcast is an in-depth look at a variety of the different franchises, developers, and studios around the world that form the greatest entertainment medium in the world. History, conversations, fun facts about franchises you thought you knew everything about, this is Random Access Memories. Random Access Memories is a podcast produced by Ron's Pies, a YouTube channel dedicated to in-depth looks at video games. If you like the podcast, please follow the show on your podcast podcast distribution platform of choice, leave a positive review, and subscribe to the channel. With that, please enjoy the show. Welcome to Random Access Memories. My name is Wade Ronspiece, and I'm joined by my friend Keegan Aylers. Hello. <laughs> this is episode three, and also part three of our series all about the history and creation of Halo. If you want to catch up, I heavily encourage you to check out the previous two episodes. I promise they won't be hard to miss since they're the only two episodes of the show before this one. But uh, yeah, today is about the changing of the Garden Halo, the end of Bungie's role in Halo's story, and the beginning of 343 Industries. So let's pick up from where we left off last time, shall we, Keegan? I am all for it. Before we start, though, do you want to sound off and just maybe say something about last week's episode if you want yeah i mean obviously we ended with halo 3 and that was you know like kind of like we talked about that was like our halo you know that was our foray into well actually we started with halo 3 but well yeah but i mean well i'm just saying halo 3 is the main thing you know technically yeah yeah that was the bulk of the episode we had odst you know and whatnot but like essentially but yeah it's just that trilogy was the end of it and now you know so like you know all of us being the young kids and most adults, I would say, too, thought that was the end. Yeah, so. well, Bungie, that was the idea, was that th- Halo 3 would at the very least be the end of Master Chief's story. Yeah. As, like, and that was for them. Exactly. So, but, yeah. Yeah, when they didn't even really, when we talk about it, but, like, they didn't even really intend on it being a trilogy they th- like they pretty much treated halo 2 almost like that was going to be the end so like they were sad when they had to like leave some stuff behind for a third game so for all intents and purposes halo 3 was meant to be the end but as we discussed it was part of their contract to make two more games um one of which we talked about last time which was odst and we'll talk about the next game Right now. In the story, it's 2009. Halo Wars and Halo 3 ODST are out in the wild and receiving positive critical and commercial success. But something I didn't mention last episode is that Bungie had actually split into two separate teams for the development of Halo 3 ODST. ODST didn't get the full force of Bungie's workforce during its development. As we explained, ODST was always planned as a smaller project from the beginning, after all. But while the smaller team focused on what was known at the time as Recon, 
The bulk of Bungie was hard at work on what would be their final project for Halo and the last game they were contractually obligated to make for Microsoft. The end was approaching, and for the end of it all, Bungie wanted to look to the beginning. Halo 3 was considered to be the end of Master Chief's story, at least for Bungie. The ending has Chief literally saying, Wake me when you need me. To me, that's essentially Bungie symbolically saying, hey, don't touch Master Chief unless you really feel like you need to, or to whoever takes Halo after us, here's something for you. So with Bungie themselves saying no Master Chief for their final game, it only made sense for them to look toward one of the most infamous pieces of lore within Halo and the peak of UNSC power, the fall of Reach. With Reach, you had nearly unlimited options. Spartans were a common sight, all kinds of vehicles and weapons, epic battlefields. Even though it takes place before the events of the other Halo games, it truly is a culmination of everything Bungie had previously established. Am I right in saying that Reach was like UNSC at its peak? Because you yeah. had all the Spartans and yeah. everything. Um, I will add into this, just a quick lore thing for all, for all of you that do <laughs> not know, here. Halo Reach to Halo 3 is all within a month and a half. Oh, yeah. Because um, the ending of Halo Reach is literally like the... It, it's the ending of Halo Reach Halo is, the, is the beginning sea. of Halo 1. Yep, yep. Literally, they, the pillar of autumn goes the into the sea. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah. Literally, it, it's pretty much the peak. Reach was the, you know, the... It was the military planet of mm -hmm. the UNSC. So, basically, they, that you was know... That all their they had, stuff was. And that's why it was such a shock when the Covenant... Yeah. Attack were there in such a huge force it was just like they I mean I don't want to like compare this to a heavy world of, but it's like Pearl Harbor in a way where it's just like what yeah you know exactly. it, was, it was really like awakening the giant but it was in that intense. case the attacking force won the day exactly but that was the the cool thing about Reach is that I mean even in um the first trailer they ever posted for Reach on YouTube the description is um, you know how it ends before it even begins or something like that. Yeah. Which is like... So everybody they knew, knew from what the happened. That, yeah. Because the beginning of CE is they're fleeing from Reach. Yep. Yep. How the Pillar of Autumn gets away. Them. The epic scale of Halo 3, the character-driven story from ODST, the lessons learned from the design of CE and Halo 2, plus tons of other innovations and ideas making their first appearance in Halo, like full-scale space combat. But at the center of it all, Bungie's goal with Reach was to uncover the core of Halo and realize why it became successful in the first place with Combat Evolved. An open, alien world full of mystery and intrigue, a combat sandbox full of options, an alien enemy that felt dangerous and threatening. Thing. Halo Reach is Halo at its absolute best. Bungie firing on all cylinders, which I believe is the phrase I also used when describing Halo 3, firing on all cylinders. <laughs> but it's it's true, you know, they were never not going all in. No. But Reach really was the peak. Well, yeah, of they their were going all out. It was their last skill. thing, so why not? They they, they took this they time went the they right knew. they went the right route and instead of being like, "Huh, here's a little whatever game." It's like, "No, we're going to Instead of Go making, they could have bang. easily just done two spinoffs and called it good. As Sergeant Johnson once said, they're going to go out with a bang. He knows what the ladies like. Exactly. But yeah, I, I really, tr like, this time they knew for sure it was going to be their last game. And so yep. this was the peak of their natural ambition and skill, is what I say <laughs> in the script. Reach was initially going to reuse and update all sorts of assets from Halo 3, but instead... They opted to remake all of those assets from scratch for inherently better texture quality. Bungie didn't want to half-ass an inch of Reach. Apparently one assault rifle in Reach had the same polygon count as entire character models in Halo 3, and other assets had quadruple the quality when compared to its predecessor. Not to mention the advances Bungie made in regards to facial animation, especially when compared to Halo 3. Lord Hood comes oh, to mind. God. You know, we talk about that last episode where Lord Hood just looks... His face is terrible. But, um, as I say here, Halo Reach would be the first time we see Spartans without their helmets on, so Bungie really wanted to make sure they could properly display expressions and emotion, especially considering the tone of the story. Again, another lesson they learned from ODST that they were applying to Reach. Because ODST was, um, one of the first ones where, like, the main cast, it was very common for them to, like, you would see through their visor or they would take their helmet off. Yep, besides the actual protagonist. Yeah, but, like, it. because they wanted to kind of... They wanted more character-driven storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we can't have... Like, we need emotion and expression from our characters. We can't do that if all our characters look as bad as Lord Hood. So, yeah. So they really went hard on that. And they, they make a point when in saying that in, like, a lot of the behind-the-scenes documentaries. Like, we really wanted to up our game on facial 
tech, Bungie threw out almost everything to start anew for Reach because, quote, that content didn't represent the new bar we were going for, according to lead animator Rick Lico. Lico? Rick Lico? Uh, I said from day one, I'm gonna butcher names, just cause like, I don't know these people personally, and I have not heard their names used in common conversation, just in lower thirds. But, um, I love that quote cause it's like, Halo 3's content didn't represent the new bar we were going for, so we had to just start over. <laughs> it's just like, okay. Yeah, they set themselves up, be like, hey, this is it, let's do it. Plus, it makes sense that they decided to remake and redesign certain assets, considering Reach is a prequel, but like you said, it only it's only like a month before the no, events of it's, Halo it's, 3. Yeah, so it's like, some of it's Halo like, 3, yeah. uh, how much, like, it's weird that the assault rifle changed so much in a yep. month, but okay. But it's a different variation too. But you could also, yeah, you could also say like, this is the variation they had on Reach because it was the more advanced yep. military base of the UNSC, so they had the best weaponry, so it makes sense that some of it looks and performs a little differently. Yep. Was there ever a reason they explained the 60 round mag in CE? For the assault rifle? No, they. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just that. So the CE AR, the Halo Three AR, and the Reach AR are literally all different variants of them. Yeah, and it's and the way they explain it, and like in the books too, um, Contact Harvest, which is like the first like where the Covenant first like met the humans. Yeah. Johnson's in it, and he uses the BR for the first time. They're like, here, use this prototype three shot uh, burst gun and it's like nice. the battle rifle like yeah so it's just there's so many different like you can see like the smgs you know there's however many different smgs well, well throughout the smg the was kind of initially meant to replace the assault rifle yeah exactly because they felt the assault rifle was more of an smg than an assault rifle yeah and so it's like well for an actual assault rifle here's the battle rifle and for you know a more close range yeah. auto thing here's the smg and then it gets all messed up when they added all of them together but it's fine yeah but yeah there's just there's so many variations and they explain mm -hmm. them and they all have like the mark or it's like the ma5b the ma5c yeah i think i've like seen that all that stuff and it's that's how they kind of get away with changing yeah. it every game and then <laughs> i mean the reach rifle looks to be back in yeah infinite so it even sounds i know they all sound somewhat similar but like it, the aesthetically it looks very very similar but like i the sound design also of yeah. the, the new assault rifle sounds very much like like uh reaches assault rifle which i like yeah um but yeah the more you look into reach and its creation the more you come to understand how perfect it was to go back in time for the finale you had everything all together all at once um, and for the first time, players would be able to fully customize their own personal Spartan soldier, nicknamed Noble Six. Armor pieces, color combinations. Players could finally leave their own personal mark on the Halo universe and see their own creations in cutscenes and online matches. But yeah, like, like we were saying, it just made perfect sense for a prequel because it gave you the opportunity to really kind of mess around. I mean, like, all, you've said before that it is kind of weird that you're messing with something that was already described in the books and you're kind of changing the canon quite a bit. Yeah, but But the at the thing same is, time, it's like it had so many great gameplay opportunities. Oh yeah, and, and I don't bash on it at all. I loved Halo Reach. But yeah. the the aspect, now guys, when I go back, the there's the Fall of Reach, the book mm -hmm. written by Eric Nyland. I, which was written before Halo 3, I think, after Halo 2, um, mm -hmm. which has two iterations, actually. I have the old iteration that he actually changed up in the second. Anyway, um, Interesting. that does follow the story of Chief, like, from mm -hmm. when he was, you know, conscripted into the UNSC as a child up to the events of Halo CE. And mm -hmm. Reach, the game, you follow a Spartan 3. Yeah. So it's very different sides of it. So I think that's where they were like, you know, as we talked, as you talked about initially, you know, it's they're done with the chief. So why go back yeah. and mess with the chief? Exactly. And prior to something I love CE. in uh, the Master Chief collection actually does this. But like there is that Easter egg in Reach where it, when that cutscene on the yeah, if you pull to on the, the right. bottom, if you turn the camera during the cutscene, you can see the chief, um, in, chief in the cryopod that he wakes yep. up in in CE. But like. In uh, the Master Chief collection, when you do that, um, you get an achievement saying, see, he is in the game. <laughs> so it's like, see? Uh, and I think the description is like, That's Master funny. Chief uh, collection status confirmed or something like that. That's funny. So it's like, it technically is still, you know, part of yeah. Chief's story, even even in the story that isn't about Master Chief. But, but like, yeah. I'll talk about this later, but like, and we already kind of touched on the intro, how like the story of Reach is kind of the story of 
hope in the form of Master Chief and Cortana mm-hmm. of like getting them like if we're gonna do anything we gotta get this guy and this AI out of here exactly and it's like you know in Keys is the guy's like you know when Keys oh, when gets he sh- Cortana I forgot about it when I replayed it I was like oh yeah, shit yeah and he's like we could we could use you and he's like no I'll stay here and protect you you're like holy crap like that's Keys like that yeah. dude is like he's such a his role in Halo 1 is so significant but yeah. like through the greater, you know, scheme of like the entire franchise, well, that's why a prequel he is so cool because yeah. you get those characters that show up only well, in like, Halsey, one game. You get Halsey and there, then and it's like, oh, they yeah. were important. It, it's like a why Rogue One was a good uh, prequel because it it contextualizes stuff we already knew. Exactly, and that leads directly into a new hope, mm-hmm. and it, it brings up like you know stuff like that where yes, it throws in some new stuff at you that like. You know, it's kind of random and whatnot. You did and there's stuff that's need obviously it. fan service. Like, exactly. do Captain Keys have to show up? No, probably not. But still, yeah. And then, and, and as I was saying with like Halsey, like we actually get a face to Halsey because oh, yeah. you hear about yeah. Halsey all through mm-hmm. Halo One, Halo Two, Halo and she's Three. She's in the books, I imagine. And oh, she's yeah, she's in. She's like in the first chapter of the first book. Like you, you know, this all is the about first time Halsey. she's an active participant. Yeah, in the story exactly. Because you don't game. see her till Halo Four. Like that, mm-hmm. you know, or Halo Five. Like you don't really see her character, so you don't really know like who basically the mother is until Reach and mm-hmm. her. You know how George in yeah. in Reach is an actual. He's a Spartan too, not a Spartan three. And he's like, mm-hmm. oh, hey, mom. That's why he has that like, giant armor too, yeah, right? Because yeah, it's, the Spartan he's so twos much had that like tank armor. Spartan twos were so much bigger than Spartan. 3s. It was more like an exosuit than yeah. armor. Exactly. So, like, that that's also, like, a thing, too. It's, like, where you're actually being, like, well, here's, like, the actual creator of the Spartan 2s. Like, this is yeah. the person. So and, like, like, that's why Reach is so good is because you get so many gameplay opportunities, but you also get so many lore opportunities. Oh, and it's huge. It, it, it's it's just massive. And it's so cool. Like, I in, like, you know, obviously we were young and, like, big into that then, but it's still, like, going back on it, you're, like, this game is, like, I couldn't imagine if that game came out. Could you imagine if that was the first Halo game? If they did Reach, then CE, then 2, then 3, how just vastly different yeah. the franchise would be now. So it's like, the way they did it, I, they did it well, again, perfectly, like, I, in my opinion. I think a, the really, a really good comparison is to, like, Rogue One, how it just does such a good job of, like, contextualizing things you already know. And, like, it almost needed to be told after the fact. Yeah, because exactly. Because with it adds so much weight to everything. If that was the first story you were playing, yeah, you're playing it in chronological order, but, you know, the way of seeing Captain Keys, understanding the sacrifice of all the soldiers there, understanding the role of Reach in the greater lore and Halsey and all that, you know, going in already knowing all that, it just makes every single little detail that much more impactful. Yeah, and, you know, back to the whole customization thing, too, where it's, like, oh, yeah. you're one minuscule Spartan 3, but it's, like, like I didn't think I didn't think about that much then, but I thought, thought, I just thought it was so B.A. to be, like, dude, I've got my funky-colored Spartan with his Hell yeah, dude. Like, it's so cool, cool just, armor. Like, that's what I love about Reach is that it lets you, leave, like, leave your own little personal mark on the universe of Halo. Exactly. Like, yeah, your Spartan isn't canon and never will be, but still, just seeing... Your creation that you got through playing multiplayer and stuff like that, and you choosing your own color scheme, and if you want to be a man or a woman, and all that. It's just like it adds so much immersion to it, which is like kind of a cheap, easy word to use, but it really does feel like like it puts it just places you in that world with that with those characters so much more. Oh, yeah, and oh, it's so it's so good. It's incredible how even after a decade of making Halo games, Bungie was still finding inventive and exciting ways to reinvigorate both Halo and shooters as a whole. With the more level design diversity came more varying ranged combat, which prompted Bungie to introduce new weapons like the DMR. The Magnum Pistol also got an old school rework, though it's still a far cry from the infamously overpowered hand cannon from CE, but now you could ADS again while shooting. Yep. But the recoil on the Magnum and oh, Reach so bad. Is- <laughs> Oh, but God. like, well, just compared to CE, it's like oh yeah, CE had no recoil. Yeah, <laughs> so like they definitely still they wanted to like see how you could go from like that they is, wanted it comparable to CE's yeah. Magnum in terms of like feel, but they didn't want it to be oh, as yeah. unbalanced as yeah. that thing. And that's like the one thing, like going through each game, the Magnum has never been the same Magnum through oh, every no. game. It, it's been a different gun every game. The so, most so, so similar, I think, is like Reach to CE. 
Yeah, in where terms it's of like, like the old school Magnum, the look and everything like that, but yeah. it's a little bit more rapid, but still like or like it's it's just, it's funny. It's really funny seeing the differences. Yeah. For Reach, Bungie also added armor abilities, basically permanent power ups that act on a cooldown that players can activate whenever they need to. They're like an evolution of the equipment from Halo 3. Holograms, jetpacks, active cloaking, but most famously, or perhaps infamously, you had armor walking and sprinting. There was a huge concern at the time that sprinting, a typical convention for Halo's FPS competitors, had no place in a game like Halo. It had the potential to dramatically impact the pacing of multiplayer matches, but locking it to an optional ability with a cooldown was Bungie's way of limiting its game-breaking possibilities. So are we team sprint or team no sprint? Honestly, I prefer no sprint because mm. I grew up playing Halo 3 to where you didn't yeah. have it to where now you play think, a game like Halo yeah. 5 and you've got sprint boost clamber yeah. and it, the games are so fast paced now but that's I think that Mobility more so fun, says but yeah. yeah but I think that more so says about FPS as a genre yeah. than Halo as a game because they're moving towards a more people really underestimate game. how revolutionary Titanfall was oh yeah how that just like they made every single developer think more about mobility in first-person shooters. Yeah. So all of a sudden, every FPS needed double jumping, mounting, wall running, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like oh, yeah. thrusters and all that. But um, you play Halo, the older Halo games on Master Chief Collection, and, like, you get by fine. You don't even really think about it after a few minutes. It, after just, a couple of, you know, for me, like, when I, when I you know, if match, I were to go back now. The maps are also so well designed. Yeah. You don't need if to. If I were to go back spend. now... And like when I have in the past, I feel kind of slow playing like Halo Three yeah. or Halo Two. But after like a Especially game or two, some of the big maps. Yeah, after Halo, but after a game or two, you get into it and you're like, oh wait, this is great. Like, but you that's focus also like why the... vehicles are important in those exactly. older games, exactly, because those help you get around way faster. And when you don't have one, you feel like you're a turtle. But that's the point: is like you want to be in a vehicle to get around faster. But I, I kind of like the way Reach does it, where it doesn't like it's not unvaluable but it's also st like sprinting it's there has its uses but it's not like yeah pace breaking or anything like that no. because it is on it's very short the amount you can sprint and reach is very short and it's on such a big cooldown it's kind of and plus you're at such a disadvantage when you're sprinting it's yeah. almost better to always lower. have that gun up yeah. and be ready for anything i'm not really team no sprint or team sprint i just kind of i guess i'm team no sprint <laughs> it's exactly. like i don't really see <laughs> It, it doesn't need to be in Halo. In the fashion of Halo. I won't Halo. say it has no place in Halo, but yeah. I'll also say it never needed to be in Halo. Exactly. Also, shout out to Armor Locking. Dude, best so ability. So cool. Best ability. I love watching the behind-the-scenes documentaries of, uh, especially the beta for Reach, because Luke Smith, who right now is the creative director on Destiny 2, there's a lot of, like, he was a designer on Halo Reach, and there's a lot of things, like, they're talking about the armor ability, and he's like, right now, everyone's obsessed with Armor Lock. It's just so cool. Just being able to turn invincible for a limited amount of time, destroy a, a warthog that's coming right at you. Like, I feel like arm, the armor locking is is the biggest um, evolution of those equipment abilities in Halo 3. Yeah. How instead of like, oh, you use a mine to destroy vehicles or use a bubble shield to avoid damage, you put both of those in one thing. Nope, it's just the Spartan. Oh, and, and like that's the thing, armor, like the ability to, like armor lock is a thing in the lore that it's like a survival mode. Yeah, when the chief that's falls how in Master 3. Master Chief survives the orbital he fall up his armor. in Halo 2 to 3. Yeah. You know, his armor locked up. And so... It is a piece of the lore, and so I thought that was a genius way of implementing that as well. It's just exactly. like we're using cool parts of the lore to make gameplay more exciting. Oh, Reach is so good. <laughs> so good. But perhaps the most revolutionary addition to Reach was the introduction of Assassinations, a unique melee animation that could only be triggered by getting the jump on an unaware enemy from behind. The idea of an assassination was almost an extension of teabagging. It was yet another way to disrespect and humiliate your own opponents. Assassinations might seem minor in the grand scheme of things, but they've been a constant in the series ever since Reach, and they've also been included in competitors like Battlefield and the latest Call of Duty, Modern Warfare. It was also a huge point of buzz leading up to Reach's release. Assassinations were a huge, exciting deal, and further 
proof that Bungie has always been ahead of the curve. I remember the lead up to Reach and Assassinations being such a cool like, Dude, they big were deal. so cool. And like depending yeah. on what Even weapon in the you campaign, had, it was just like, dude, being yeah. assassinating an elite. Yeah, or like yeah, running up an elite and like snapping its neck. That was so sweet. Or like the multiplayer especially. Dude, oh yeah, like, like when you had a sword assassinating someone as like an elite and they were a Spartan and you just run it through the back of their body and just drop and, them like, on the you ground. And like you do assassinations with the flag too. Yeah, yeah, you'd stab him with the flag and like there were so many different animations. It was really cool. And it's like, funny though that I point out it was like a replacement or an evolution for teabagging. Let's be real. You Every still teabagged afterwards. Was always led, always followed by teabagging. Oh, I always did. Yeah, it's like, but it's like when you get assassinated, that's already humiliating enough. Exactly. It's like, it's like look, man. Yeah, you got me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, and the multiplayer of Halo oh. Reach. So. I don't know good. if I would call it the best. Well, in the dude, series. just the, the, I, I I like the way they did it from three to the X. Because remember yeah. three, as I talked about last episode, three was you win one game, you get one XP. Yeah, and yeah, and, Reach but was, was very it. much the modernization. Yeah, of and Reach was like you got points based on how you did. Mm-hmm. You know the ranking system. I I miss the Reach ranking system. I hope they bring yeah. it back because the numbered system in four and five I hate. Yeah. Well, and, and they also they talk about in uh, the behind the scenes how there was also like social matchmaking. Yeah. Where they would try to match you up with similarly styled players, where it's like not just players of similar skill, but also players who have a similar play style to you. You know, where it's like a bit more. If you play a bit more casually or more reserved, then you'll get matched with players that play the same way and so you get less frustrating matches exactly like let's say you're a casual player you don't want to be matched every single match with a team going hard mlg pro every we don't want no sweaty games yeah and so they did a lot of under the hood stuff with matchmaking and reach as well but just the maps oh they also added call outs um to reach where it's just on the map they would have the call outs to that where you were on the map oh yeah right right by the map. that was a big deal too. that was really cool to know where you were at yep that was like never really in an fps an online fps before it was all just like colloquial fan dubbed you know call outs where it's like oh i'm in a spaghetti shop i'm in a kentucky fried chicken or whatever it's like here it, it actually labeled each section of the map on the screen so you could more accurately describe where you were at to your teammates Exactly. Which is such a small thing, but again, it just shows the love and attention that Bungie was giving the multiplayer in Reach, where it's just little tiny things that go a long way. You know, that was, I think that's like the whole charm of Reach is that they just added so many little tiny things to the Halo formula that all added up to a really nice package. And the maps themselves are so good. Oh, well, the and like the maps base for one the modes. With the bridges and the, yeah. Oh, so good. Oh. Yeah. And like a lot of the big team maps too. Like there's that one, the marquee map where it has like that fountain in the middle, if you know what I'm talking about. Yep, yep, yep. I know what you're talking about. It was really heavily featured in the beta, I remember. Like that map is, all the maps are great. Miss those Um, days. I I really do miss those days. That was really something else, but, and like unlocking armor pieces as you level up. (laughs) It wasn't unlocking them, it was unlocking and then buying them, wasn't it? Because you you had to buy them after you unlock them. Yeah. Because once you hit the level, you could unlock them. Which was really cool. Yeah, you basically chose what you wanted. Yeah, and like, you know, they had the armor uh, cosmetic stuff too. Like, you could run around with, like, the grunt birthday party stuff. When oh, you died. yeah, that stuff, too. And in That's where that weather. Like, kind of began, right? Um, well, re- in Halo 3, they had the flaming skull, the flaming helmet. But, yeah, no, they had, they really went into it on this. Yeah. And it was, it was just well, aesthetic. Well, so much of Reach was, like, we know what the fans want, so we're just going to lean into that real exactly. hard. Exactly, yeah. And so some of the stuff might seem weird to, like, someone coming in for the first time, but if you're a longtime fan, a lot of this stuff is like, whoa, they actually made this thing an actual feature um but the real star of halo reach however was its story and its characters i mean obviously the multiplayer is the star to a lot of people but i feel like what makes reach ascend into like legendary status is the story and the campaign of reach this was the end of everything not just for bungie but for all the heroes of planet reach the tone was the heaviest it's ever been especially considering we all know how the story ends before it even begins. The story of Reach would be the story of the heroes who fought on the front lines. This would ultimately be a human story about a select few, the elite of the elite. 
Joe Tung, executive producer at Bungie, specifically cited Seven Samurai as a huge influence on the tone of the story and the idea behind the characters. In Seven Samurai, a film directed by Akira Kurosawa, a poor farming village seeks the services of a handful of talented, legendary samurai in order to defend their village from bandits. These samurai won't be getting paid in money, though only in rice. Most samurai don't even give the farmers a second look, but the seven that do, they choose to help just for the sake of helping. The samurai know that, at best, they're getting a warm meal at the end of the battle and that's it. And at worst, they'll die in service to a village of peasants. That alone tells you the content in each of their characters. Some do it for the thrill of battle, some do it just to test their skills, others do it for the sake of justice and doing what's right. Either way, these seven samurai are each heroes in their own way, and not all of them make it out of their noble battle. It's a story of sacrifice, of heroism and selflessness in the face of overwhelming opposition. And that is also the story of Reach. Halo Reach follows Noble Team, a team of six Spartans, Emil, June, George, Kat, Carter, and the player character, Noble Six. Six is there to replace a missing in action Spartan, which is Halo's way of saying killed. After all, Spartans never die, they're just missing in action. Noble Team is at the forefront of the Covenant invasion on Reach, the tip of the spear. One of the interesting things about Halo Reach is how it adopts a more traditional military aesthetic akin to Call of Duty, but it still retains the classic Halo feel. In every way, Halo Reach is a product of influence from Bungie's biggest competitors, but in a positive and intellectual way, instead of a way that feels cheap and surface level. We kind of touched on that earlier, how like Call of Duty was kind of becoming the new hotness and like, how Reach was this kind of military aesthetic planet. And again, I feel like that was such a genius choice because Call of Duty is this new hot thing. I mean, it had been going on since 2003, but it was just becoming this really huge thing. And so for Halo to kind of adopt a similar aesthetic, but for it to still feel like Halo, because when I was replaying Halo, I'm like, wow, this really feels kind of like Call of Duty where, you know, the, the motions they're doing, like the hand signals and all the, the military it's jargon and stuff like that. I'm like, this feels like such a smart direction to go for this series right now. Just like, this is the thing that's huge right now. Yeah. We have a place that lets us do that. Let's I mean, do that. I think a big part of it too is that's the first time you feel like you're in an actual team in Halo. Well, yeah, and you're not just this like, lone you're not wolf. A one, you're not a one-man well, army hulking <laughs> tank. Even in the beginning of Reach, they almost say like, directly to the, the None player, of that lone like, wolf stuff. you're leaving that lone wolf stuff behind. Yeah. You know, they're talking about Noble Six because, like, I read the parts about you that even Oni didn't want me to. You should leave that lone wolf stuff behind. But again, it's like they're talking they're talking to the player character. They're talking to you. You know, the whole time before this in Halo, you're this lone soldier. And now you're, you're part a of a bigger squad. And it's the first time you really see those giant epic scale battles where you're part of a larger military force. I mean, in Halo 2, you get a bit of a touch of that. Um, like when you're in New Mombasa. Mm -hmm. Like that intro with all the warthogs and the pelicans flying in. Yeah. But this is the first time it's like we are in the warthog with hundreds of other warthogs on this giant vast battlefield riding toward battle. Oh, dude, you that know. scene's so cool. It's, that cutscene is very cool. Oh, so cool. Um, the heavy tone of Reach was also reflected in its original score, once again composed by Bungie's very own Martin O'Donnell. Just like how Halo CE's score was prompted by the words ancient and alien, Reach's was prompted by tragedy and heroism. And Reach has a great soundtrack. It's I I think good. it's a little, on a personal note, I think it's a little weaker compared to the previous games. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also not really trying to be the previous games. It's not as bombastic. And yeah, and like over the top as the other games where it's like, you know, it's it's not this oh you're this victorious, like you guys are winning, it's we are bowed, like everyone's yeah. dying, we are so screwed, like you literally like it like it makes you emo. Like you're like, damn, this <laughs> is sad as shit. Well and the thing is like it's also very like when you get to those more booming orchestral stuff, it's very military. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not it's not really as ominous not ominous, like like it's an ancient alien. It's not really trying to be this mysterious ancient alien world. This is Marines who are going to battle. Let's let's get it, you know. Exactly. It's like even when it does try to be epic, it's still going for something. A different kind of epic. It's, 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 it's not, it's still fantastic. To me, you know, as we're talking,
talking about it, how we talked about ODST last week. It, it's kind of mm. it, it has that ODST feel where it's yeah, it's, it's dark and mysterious. You know, it's, yeah, like you said, it's somberish. It's just it's not as lighthearted and uppity and like oh, let's get going, let's go blow well, shit like, up. I feel like the theme of the original three Halo games is hope. Yeah. Like, Bungie themselves, and, like, especially 343, they like to remind us that Master Chief is, like, this symbol of hope. But it's really evident, especially in Halo 3 soundtrack, when you're on the last level, with the, the, the main theme comes in, it's the final, you know, the final level version of the main theme. It's very heroic, very exciting. You know, this thing is, you are the hero. Whereas this, it's just, you're a cog in the machine, and you're part of a larger picture that is ultimately about to be torn to shreds. You're there to die. Mm hmm So good. I yeah. love Halo Reach so I don't, much. Yeah. I don't think you can not like a Halo soundtrack. Yeah. Every single one is good. Even like four and five yeah. have some bangers. Exactly. And from what we've heard of Infinite, it has some great tracks. Like Which, that. Yeah. The Halo Infinite in that trailer, the speech at the end from the brute has been oh, kind of yeah. memed on because the graphics but the yeah. music in that scene is so good who's doing the music who's i don't composing. remember it's not michael salvatore because i believe he's still working with bungie but michael salvatore we'll talk about him later he was kind of marno donald's not assistant but definitely Apprentice. his like kind of first hand kind of guy yeah um exactly. but i don't i don't know who who's do, who's composing infinite but They've released a couple of the tracks, and they're both great. Yeah. The Halo soundtrack, no matter which one you... Obviously, the Bungie-era soundtracks are the best. Yes. But In our opinion. But the three... I mean, I don't think it's even an opinion. I think obje well, <laughs> objectively true. speaking, they're the best in Halo. True. But because like I feel like 4, 5, and Infinite, they're just chasing what was done. I mean, you could say that about 343 three in general, that they're just chasing what Bungie's done. But... I feel like that's especially evident in the soundtracks. Anyway, the buildup to Halo Reach's release in 2010 was intense, to say the least. And I'm not talking about the vibe within Bungie. I mean in the streets, among the people excited for the next Halo. There really wasn't anything else like the hype leading up to Halo Reach, even compared to Halo 2 and 3, which, you know, we know those were hyped to hell, but this was, I feel like, next level hype. And maybe it was generational, maybe it was due to how we all matured with the series over the years. Or maybe it was due to how far we were into the generation, where Xbox was at the time, the vibe of the console. Or maybe it was because we all knew it was Bungie's last crack at Halo. Either way, whatever the reason, the fact remains that the air felt different in that time, tinged with a level of excitement we had never felt before. Dude, so, are you ready for Halo Reach? Ready? Ready doesn't even fucking describe it. That was the first time I was on the front lines of the re of Halo hype, dude. But seriously, like, yeah, this that was, was next level. This Reach was the first game that I bought the most expensive edition for the collector's edition. Yep, I got the one hundred and fifty dollar. That was the giant statue of all oh, nobles one through six. That's sick. Do you I still got, have that? I gave it to a friend. Um. But, and then that was the first game I actually went to the midnight premiere of. Oh, hell yeah. I didn't, yeah. because I, I, we I didn't play it till, yeah. I had an Xbox, but it was just like, I wasn't buying Xbox games. Yeah. We were frequently. freshmen. I remember that. I remember, I think my mm. grandma dropped me off and my, someone gave me a ride home because I said I'd get a ride home, but that was the first game I ever went and stood outside and waited for the midnight release <laughs> for a game at our hometown GameStop. And it mm -hmm. was so freaking cool. The I I didn't get an Xbox until like a few months after Reach, but I still was like there, like I want to play this game. Oh yeah, it, you know? but and that was the thing is like, not everybody had Xboxes when Halo Three came out. Yeah, it, but like eventually I'll go our, on to grade. play Reach. And yeah, especially in our grade. And I, I was came there out. waiting on bated breath with every trailer because yeah. I knew oh, I was yeah. going to play this game at some point. Well, yeah, and when this game came out, it was like everybody in our grade, minus mm -hmm. you. Had X, well, who had Xboxes? I eventually, yeah, who had there. Xboxes? Literally, we're all playing Reach the first night. It, it was out. like, um, it was like, a uh, like Mario Kart with Nintendo consoles, and like, yeah, um, it's like if you own this console, you buy this game. <laughs> you know, exactly. like if you own an Xbox 360, you were buying Reach. That is just how it's going. But yeah, that was such a fun time. Oh, I miss those days. It just, it still makes my heart feel things whenever I think about midnight releases, specifically the midnight release of Reach and the Mountain Dew, Game Fuel. Oh, 
Oh, Don't man. get me started. Mountain Dew Game Fuel is my favorite pop for for the uh, reason Game, of Halo. Game Fuel started with Halo Three. Yes, I remember that. We, sh- we should have talked about that. Oh, dude, that was. We'll talk, maybe we'll talk about that with Halo Four because I believe they did that with Halo Four as well. They did. Yep, because that's because I remember they had the I, the new armor where he was looking off into the distance with the oh. AR at his side on the wrapping or whatever. I remember that. Dude, Halo Reach was really special. Oh. And just like the DMR, I just remember like looking at the DMR and be like, I want to shoot that gun. Yeah, because I was like, Oh my god, there's no <laughs> BR. <laughs> but it's a single shot long like marksman rifle. I was like, okay, like we'll see how this is. And I was like, oh wow, okay. Six point five million dollars went into Halo Reach's marketing budget, the biggest of any Microsoft game up to that point. Which may be the real reason why the hype for Reach felt different to everybody. Live action shorts, in-game trailers, mini documentaries, merchandise, all with the simple yet poignant tagline, remember Reach. It's just oh and just like the, the ads made you feel things too. And just remember Reach, such a genius tagline. Cause it says everything you need to know about the game and it's classy, it doesn't feel too bombastic. It fits the tone perfectly. Ugh. Yeah, we, um, we were just ready. Like, like that oh was yeah. like, just everybody was like, this is like the epitome of Halo. And it, it truly was. That was the idea. Yeah. And Halo Reach came out on September 14th, 2010. I remember like, sept- yeah, it was September. I was like, yep. usually, I remember it being like feeling it was like early. The beginning, it was like the it was like early beginning of football season for me. It was yeah. like, like it was like the third week of it was like a third. <laughs> we week all remember of where we were when Halo yeah, Reach came exactly. out. Exactly, like I remember how we felt. Exactly, you know. I remember at the time, just like I remember, just those autumn vibes. Oh, just being so hyped. It was like the perfect time for a midnight release too, because not too cold, not too not, hot. You know, you're not sweating. It's not that humid Nebraska night air. Ugh, um, gross. But uh, in one day. It made $200 million. It was only the third game of the 360 PS3 generation to sell over 3 million copies in its release month after Halo 2 and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Nope. I really hope we get to Call of Duty at some after point. After Halo 3. I'm at Halo 3 and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. There you go. I got my numbers mixed up. That's why uh, I'm here. <laughs> Reach received universal acclaim from every major gaming news outlet. Countless nines and tens across the board. Once again, Halo garnered numerous honors at award shows, though admittedly not as many as years prior. 2010 was a pretty stacked year with games like Red Dead Redemption, Mass Effect 2, and God of War 3. That's not to say Reach was overlooked, however, it's easy to understand why Halo wasn't this goatee winning machine anymore. Halo Reach currently sits at a 91 on Metacritic. Even with all that financial and critical success, however, Halo Reach was still only the third best-selling game of 2010, behind Call of Duty Black Ops and Madden NFL 2011. What was the goatee that year? Um, I mean, it it depends on where you look, obviously. Um, What Spike gave it? Red Dead Redemption. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Red Dead Redemption was the VGA winner that year. Yep, that makes Which, sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a big game. Still holds up. It does. Red Dead 1 holds up well. But if anything, that just goes to show you that despite Halo Reach breaking the series' own records, there's a new big man on campus, and his name was Call of Duty. Halo was breaking records, but it seemed to be on the way out in favor of new experiences. The military shooter, the sci-fi RPG, the western open world game. Yet again, It seems like Bungie called their shots to perfection. They knew it was time for Halo to end, and they were happy they could end it with the masterpiece that is Halo Reach. They absolutely went out on top. Again, like, it's almost like Bungie knew this was where you should end it, because it was kind of just naturally be on its way out. Like, as we'll see, it only gets bigger each year with sales-wise, but, like, it's no longer this juggernaut, unbeatable franchise. You know, that was now Call of Duty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's almost like Bungie knew it's like it's time to let go and it's time to close up things. the doors. This is no longer this this it's still giant, but Call of Duty is just usurping it at every level. And so maybe you shouldn't treat it like like Call of Duty, you know. 2010 was stacked. Dude, I remember Mass Black Effect Ops 2 was huge. Black Ops, Mass Effect 2. Yeah, Mass that was, 2 was a big deal. Oh my god, I remember that game. That game that was, was on PS3 as well. Yeah. Because uh, Mass Effect 1 was a 360 exclusive, but then 2 was also on PS3, so a lot of PS3 fans could add it to the hype. And God of War 3 is so good. But hey, God of War 3 was kind of in a similar situ- situation to Reach. It was kind of meant to be the end, and it was kind of on its natural way out as well. It's sad that Reach 
I think didn't get the recognition it deserved, but I think the people who play it know. And even though some games like Red Dead Redemption, even I would say maybe Red Dead Redemption is a better game than Halo Reach, that's still like Halo Reach is still one of the best games of 2010. But it's like, you could say the same thing about like Halo 3. Was that the best game of 2007 in a world that also had, uh, I think, uh, Call of Duty 4? And like, was Halo 3 goatee in the year of Bioshock, Mario Galaxy, Mass Effect 1, Portal? You know, it's like, not to everybody, obviously, but maybe maybe I'm overselling how it was on its, how Halo was on its way out, but I don't know. Um, Halo Reach would eventually get multiplayer DLC, but almost none of it was developed by Bungie themselves. Bungie was already out on their own, enjoying their newfound freedom. Instead of Bungie, the DLC was developed by Certain Affinity and 343 Industries, marking 343's di first direct involvement making a Halo game. At the end of Seven Samurai, the leader of the group makes a poignant statement after reflecting on the loss of his fellow samurai. So, again we are defeated, the farmers have won, not us. The samurai have won the day, but at a terrible cost. The people who receive the fruits of victory have won, but the people who sacrificed for that victory, they've lost. You can equate this quote and the story of Seven Samurai to both the tragedy of Reach and the departure of Bungie from Microsoft and Halo. The war was won. Bungie did everything they possibly could, but now it was time to leave everything behind. At the end of Halo Reach, Noble Team sacrifices themselves to transport Cortana, Master Chief, Captain Keys, and the Pillar of Autumn off of Reach safely. They sacrifice themselves for the sake of humanity's future, earning their squad name of Noble. It's a bittersweet and beautiful moment symbolizing the send-off of fate, the passing of the torch. Cortana and Chief could very well represent the future of Bungie, the next project they had planned. When you play Reach and you take into consideration what Bungie was planning and what they were going on to do, it only makes that ending even more impactful in my opinion. You kind of see the symbolism a bit more. Like, I really do think that ending is beautiful. It was the perfect... It was making it reach the, their last game a prequel. So perfect. I cannot describe how perfect of a decision that was. Well, yeah, I mean, just like... Well, like, and like you're sitting there, it's like, you fight and you die. And it's like, this yeah, is we'll it. Survive. Like, this we is I, the end. Yeah. For them, obviously. But like, but like, but like yeah, that's it. You see the symbolism in the ending and you realize, like how perfect it was, how, just to set it, like, how every single layer, every single decision is so perfect for a prequel. And it's disappointing sometimes, like, oh man, a prequel, like, because it's not, you're not continuing a story, you know, you're going back, so, like, the story, like, the story that you want to hear about is on hold. It, it, just the way it ended, and then, yeah. it, and it's so funny, because you're, you don't sit there and be like, oh, I, you're like, dang, I gotta wait for the next game to come out. No, literally can jump in right into playing CE right afterwards if you wanted to. Yep. In April 2010, before the release of Halo Reach, Bungie announced they were entering a 10-year partnership deal with Activision, Activision Blizzard. I put Activision Bungie. Oh Activision Blizzard. With Activision, Bungie would develop an original intellectual property, which Bungie would retain full ownership of. They wanted to be able to leave with their baby anytime they wanted, if need be, which, if you followed Bungie's recent exploits within the past few years, that came in handy <laughs> but they didn't want another halo situation on their hands they didn't want to hey we don't want to work with you guys but we still want to work on the thing we like they still want to be able to take that with them um bungie relocated to a renovated cinema complex in bellevue washington which is the city in which they currently reside they began work full-time on their next project a game they knew they wanted to make since halo 3 odst in the behind the scenes documentaries for both odst and reach you could see multiple employees wearing company merchandise with the destiny logo on them Plus, there was a poster in Halo 3 ODST with a picture of Earth on it with the tagline, Destiny Awaits. So, there you have it. Bungie was now done with Halo and done with Microsoft. They were working with Activision on what would become what we know now as Destiny, an online FPS RPG inspired by MMOs and by their previous work on Halo. A huge, living world with a never-ending wealth of lore driven by a thriving community of players. Currently, Bungie is hard at work on a new expansion to Destiny 2 called Beyond Light. They've ditched Activision and now work on Destiny 2 all on their own. They're thriving, despite everything going on in the world right now. 
Uh, most of the original staff is gone or in different roles, with Luke Smith, a designer on Halo Reach, serving as creative director on Destiny 2. Jason Jones, co-founder of Bungie, is currently the CCO of Bungie, and Pete Parsons is the current CEO. In 2014, Martin O'Donnell was allegedly fired without cause after a troubled development cycle on Destiny. O'Donnell would go on to co-found his own studio called Highwire Games. Michael Salvatore, a collaborator with O'Donnell, is the current composer at Bungie, with his most recent work being Destiny 2. Alex Seropian, co-founder of Bungie, started a studio called Industrial Toys in 2012, and the studio is currently owned by EA. And that's that on Bungie. Their role in the story is now complete. I wanted to touch base a little bit on like where they are now. You always see at the end of like biopics and movies where they are real stories of like what are they doing now the baseball the stud quarterback did it yeah (laughs) i wanted a little bit of that just because like bungie is still bungie is you know why we have halo so it's important to keep even modern bungie which isn't you know the bungie that made halo but it's still important to keep them in mind especially because a lot of the original staff either left or i mean the whole martin o'donnell thing that's a huge that's a podcast episode on its own but yeah again that's that's post halo i didn't really want to get too deep on that so i'm sure you understand i i do i, I maybe do. we'll just do a one parter on destiny maybe but yeah bungie's role in this story is complete the transfer is complete microsoft is now in complete and total control of halo they had big plans for halo such big plans in fact they founded a whole studio specifically to make Halo games for the foreseeable future. Enter 343 Industries. We're finally going to talk about them. Established in 2007, immediately following the announcement of Bungie's departure from Microsoft, 343 Industries was founded by Bonnie Ross, a former producer on games like Zoo Tycoon, Counter-Strike, Jade Empire, Psychonauts, Gears of War, and Mass Effect. She already had a pretty positive track record when it came to Microsoft game properties, so she was the one chosen to helm 343 Industries in 2007. Currently, she serves as 343's vice president, and whatever your opinions are on her, it's pretty, like, when you look at her track record, it's like, yeah, that made sense why they chose her to helm a, an Xbox game studio, you know, because yeah. she helped produce so many games that were exclusive to Xbox, so it was just like, all right, here you go. But yeah, um... The idea behind 343 wasn't just to be a game development studio, it was to be THE development hub for all things Halo. As I said earlier, 343's first job on a Halo game was making DLC maps for Halo Reach, but 343's long-lasting relationship with Halo actually started with a seven-part anime anthology series called Halo Legends. Halo Legends featured short films produced by anime production titans like Production IG, Toei Animation and Bones, and for context, Production IG is most known for films and shows like Ghost in the Shell and Psychopaths, Toei for Dragon Ball and One Piece, and Bones for Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and My Hero Academia. Shout out to anime. Always. Always and forever. Oh, <laughs> uh, maybe we should do a, an episode on anime games. That'd be fun. Ooh, one, yeah, we will get there. There's so many, though. You'd we, have to choose, oh, Jesus. like, Cyber Connect 2 or something, because they make the Naruto games, maybe. And they were originally going to make a Final Fantasy VII Remake before they got kicked off, so maybe that would be an interesting story. But, anyway. Apparently, the idea of an anime anthology series was talked about at Microsoft as early as 2006. There was even a Marvel Comics tie-in around that time for a series that never came out until late 2009. Halo Legends began airing on Halo Waypoint in November 2009, and Halo Waypoint was an Xbox 360 app and a website specifically meant for stat tracking for Halo and Halo-related content. The episodes were eventually released on Blu-ray and DVD in February 2010 by Warner Bros, and Halo Legends also had a theatrical premiere that month in San Francisco. Did you see Halo Legends? Dude, I ate Halo Legends up. <laughs> that, I so, bought so it off of yes. the iTunes store, <laughs> downloaded it, like, I freaking loved Halo Legends. Is it, it good? Was, Does it, do you know what I the whole honestly, time? yeah, I, so it's anthology, so it's a bunch of different stories. Yeah, some of it's them all are self-contained like, stories. Some of them are like, kind of dorky and it's just yeah. like, yeah, that's what I saw. I, I read about it and it's like, one is very obviously not canon. Some yeah. are take there's artistic one about the arbiter in there. The, the the my favorite one is about the arbiter. It, it's it's mm. I don't know if, if it's actually canon, but it's basically how the arbiter went from you know high up in the military, mm. honored, revered, to and how he how basically you know in Halo Two when they're like the arbiter. It's basically like, between the events of Halo One and Two. No, 
Mm-mm. No, oh. no, 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 no. It's it's set thousands of years before, like when the elites are oh, still in the, the military. Oh, the Arbiter. It's, it's like the title. The title of Arbiter. It's, it's when Not it was from the like, Arbiter we know. In yeah, Halo it's it's when it went from the revered Arbiter, like super high up in the military, like he's one of the top, you know, people in the Covenant to like to someone who's effectively you're a piece of crap that we're gonna send into suicide missions, and we hope yeah. you die because you shamed us so bad. And yeah. um. I would highly suggest that. I think it's something. It's like something. It's a duel. Duels in the name. It's not duel of fates. Although, <laughs> go listen to duel of fates. Um, and then uh, there's a CG one with like five Spartans in it, and it has Kelly and Fred. Yeah, I saw there and was that an episode one's of Blue really team. cool too. Like just the CG in it's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, it's CG anime for the most part, which I'm not a huge fan of. But yeah, um, I think if you like Halo and you like anime, yeah, it's obviously it's, something you want to check It was on out. Netflix for a while. It might still be on Netflix now, but no, it's been I off checked, and on. It's not. it's not. Yeah, I mean, but I'm sure you can find it elsewhere. It, it's good. Yeah. If you want to go waste a good hour and a half, I think. Yeah, they're all like 15 minutes long. Yeah, it, it's it's a good show, and, it, and it's really cool. Oh, there's also a part one and part two that talks about um, the yeah. Forerunners. And how mm-hmm. basically how they found the flood, how they tried to contain it, and like yeah, I how saw they there was the like a, a two parter. Yeah, episode. that that one's actually really cool and informative mm-hmm. too. So if you want to like know some like forerunner lore, like that's a really cool, quick little cool. thing too. Yeah, really. It's just, and yeah, uh, I read, and apparently it's all canon with the exception of one episode, which was meant to be like a parody. Yes. Um, oh God, that sucks. But uh, <laughs> they said like it's all canon, despite a lot of the studios taking some artistic liberties, especially with some of the fight choreography, from what I've heard. Yeah, there, there's. It's anime. Yeah, it's you know. It, it's which, <laughs> I mean, you watch an ar- you, it, it, the Arbiter dual wields plasma swords. Ooh, like that's pretty cool. Like that's pretty badass. But that's like that's not something you could see not happen. Like you could no, see that happening you at definitely some point see that in happening. a thousand year history of the yeah, Arbiter. You know exactly. But uh, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's really cool. I suggest if you haven't seen it, you want something to waste of time, go watch some Halo stuff. Definitely go watch it. I really want to see it. Yeah. I, I should have seen it before this. I'm sure you could so probably can... watch it on YouTube. They probably have the parts broken yeah. up. If anything. Or maybe on even like Waypoint or something. Yeah. 343 slowly but surely grew in size in the months leading up to Bungie's departure, getting a large bulk of employees from the now defunct Pandemic Studios and Retro Studios. Pandemic worked on Star Wars Battlefront, and Retro worked on Metroid Prime. Retro is fine, by the way. Pandemic is shut down, but Ugh. Retro is currently working on Metroid Ripped Prime. To Pandemic 4. Studios. And I've also read, I've been reading about Retro, they've picked up some X343 developers to work on Metroid Prime 4, Ooh. but I wouldn't be surprised if the developers they got from 343 were developers that 343 got from Retro. That's funny. It's like, hey, you want to come back and make a new Metroid Prime game? Yeah, sure, why not? Exactly. Because um, you look at Halo 4's art design, and it's very Metroid Prime-ish. Yeah. Like, you kind of realize, like, yeah... They, they, if not, like, they were at least inspired by Metroid Prime <laughs> with some of this. But, yeah, they actually did hire a lot of people from Retro Studios. Because I wouldn't be surprised if it was a lot of people who worked on Metroid Prime. It's like, hey, I want to keep working on sci-fi shooters. Um, so, with 343 staffed up and with Bungie out of the picture, it was finally time for 343 to officially take the reins of the Halo franchise and start making games on their own. But instead of starting off with something ambitious like, say, <laughs> Halo 4 or something crazy like that, 343 started off with something safe, something sure. A remake of Halo Combat Evolved to commemorate its 10th anniversary in 2011, aptly titled Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary. For help, 343 got in touch with Saber Interactive, the team who developed a game called Time Shift. Saber had just one year to get the job done, but it was an opportunity they themselves said they couldn't pass up. I didn't exactly see a lot about, like, why they were only given a year. I think it was just maybe because they were contacted so late. And they're like, hey, we need this out in 2011. It's like, oh, it's 2010. Okay. <laughs> um, the idea behind Anniversary was to remake the game while essentially keeping it the exact same, which is, I guess, a little oxymoronic. But yeah. <laughs> all the modern visuals and amenities players would expect from a modern game, but the exact same raw gameplay and feel from the original game. A lot of assets and ideas were imported or adapted from assets Bungie created for Halo 3 and Reach. It was a pretty quickly done job, but one that does what it needs to and does it pretty well. 343 and Saber worked together to create online network play for both competitive and cooperative play too. Certain Affinity was also contracted to help out with multiplayer after their work with Halo Reach's DLC map packs. But the main thing, the main takeaway from Halo Anniversary was un- that undoubtedly caused a lot of stress during the development cycle was the ability to swap between the game's original graphics and the er- anniversary graphics at any time the player wants. 
With the press of a button, you can relive the game exactly as it shipped 10 years prior, or with the enhanced visuals 343 and Saber crafted. I think that's like the. I wish that was in everything. Like yeah. any remaster should have a button that lets you do the old graphics. But that's a lot of work because you're basically running two versions of the game at the same time. Oh yeah, and you know as we kind of previously talked about it, it, it you know it's kind of cool. But my preference, you know, is yeah. the old graphics. So I prefer. A lot that. of people prefer the old graphics just because the the colors are a bit more vibrant. Yeah, the, you get just, a little. You get the battle feedback. I guess is the way of describing it. It's just a little felt more obvious. Like where it's like the the hierarchy of Covenant, like yeah, the it, red it, and blue and you know yeah, yellow. It just color felt like reach, that kind of identify the tiers. Yeah, it's just. I mean, it's a it's a cool thing. They tried. Obviously, they did a way better job for Halo Two Anniversary. Yes, which we will talk about and later. But um, I mean, got to start somewhere. Yeah. It was their first major project, and even then, they didn't really develop it all yeah, themselves. Yeah, exactly. If this development cycle sounds a bit cold and a bit more corporate than Bungie's frat-style approach to game development, then you'd be correct. This wasn't a passion project made by a group of people dedicated to make something fun just for the hell of it. This was business. Multiple studios working together to reach a specified deadline with a bottom line to be met. That's not to say there wasn't passion in it. You wouldn't work on a Halo game if you didn't want to, and a lot of the big names at 343 were either former Bungie developers who wanted to stick with Halo, or fans who got their shot in the big leagues. The passion was absolutely there, no doubt about it, but Halo Anniversary was a sign that development for the series would be a much more corporate experience than previously. Pretty much everything from this point on would be done under the direct supervision and direction of Microsoft, a far cry from the days when Microsoft employees themselves didn't even have the keys to Bungie's offices. Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary was released on November 15th, 2011 and got generally positive reviews. Anniversary sold nearly 2.5 million copies worldwide once all things were said and done. And if you're curious why 343's focus wasn't entirely on Anniversary throughout its entire development, that's because the bulk of the team was hard at work on a game that was announced the same day Halo Anniversary was. Halo Combat Evolve Anniversary was announced at E3 2011 on June 6th, 2011. And also on that day, Microsoft announced another game in the Halo franchise. We open on the vast expanse of space, fade into a beating heart before, wham! The cryo chamber doors of the UNSC Forward Unto Dawn crash open, revealing Master Chief and a distraught Cortana caught in the middle of an explosive situation. Chief navigates the Forward Unto Dawn in zero gravity, uses a grenade launcher to blast through the debris before catching himself on the exposed edge of the ship facing a giant, planet-sized machine. Fade in, Halo 4. Not a spin-off, not a game with an original character storyline, capital H Halo 4 with a number at the end, a continuation of Master Chief's story following the climactic events of Halo 3. Wake Me When You Need Me were both Master Chief's and Bungie's final words during the original Halo trilogy, and not one year after Halo reaches release and Bungie's departure, it seemed as though Microsoft already needed Sierra 117 to get back in action. Um, Halo 4's announcement was actually crazy big, I remember. Yeah, like, it was a big It felt deal. weird. But it, it was, was big, you know, because it's Halo and it's big. I don't think people, fans didn't really let Bungie's departure deter them from being hyped. But I just remember, like, at the time being like, wow, we're already putting a number at the end. All right. It just felt so soon. Yeah. I mean, to me back then, it was like, oh, hell yeah, Halo 4. I don't think I was as hyped yeah, as people I were was hyped, for previous but it, games. It wasn't like, let's go. But it was yeah. still like, oh, nice. Which yeah. I feel like is almost a failure in a way. Because like, yeah, I feel like Halo exactly. is that, let's go franchise i mean just saw that with reach exactly and just i th again i think it was just too soon to announce halo 4 i think if they had waited honestly i think what they should have done was wait until like 2012 or announce it as an xbox one launch game maybe like wait till 2013 at least i think that would have put a lot of like oh this is an x this is next gen that would have gotten people i think oh yeah really hyped yeah but it would have helped they wanted a game out asap i think because <laughs> that's a money machine shout out to 100 gex the announcement felt early to a lot of people including me but this was something microsoft had been planning probably since the day bungie announced they'd be leaving and the day master chief went to sleep in 2008, Microsoft and Starlight Runner Entertainment assembled a lore bible for Halo in an attempt to unify the, unify the franchise and make the universe more accessible to newcomers and easier to navigate for longtime fans. Microsoft was looking to really craft a connected Halo universe. They took a very corporate approach to the whole ordeal. They didn't just like, Bungie, they would have just slapped together whatever, but this was like they went to like a corporate firm and they said, hey, make this make sense. It's like, 
I think that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah. When, when you look at what Halo has kind of become and how they've done a lot of backtracking with Infinite, where they kind of took a step back and they went, you know, right, three for three, let's just let you take care of this. From the jump, Halo 4 was planned to be one piece of a larger project called the Reclaimer Saga. The idea was to bring in material from the books, ideas from previous games that were never used, and concepts for other works in the Halo universe. Development of Halo 4, though, was not smooth at first. This was a new studio that almost immediately upscaled to levels most studios don't see until after years and years in the industry. Their first project was already being worked on by over 350 people, a far cry from Bungie's first project, which, if you recall, was two people. Instead of slowly cultivating a studio culture, a work-based hierarchy, and establishing defined roles within the studio, everyone was kind of just thrown into the deep end all at once and had to swim back to shore all at the same time. However, after working together for a working prototype for Halo 4, 343 finally felt confident enough to make production from then on relatively smooth. Master Chief and Cortana both underwent significant redesigns, with 343 wanting Chief's armor to look and feel as bulky as the lore suggested, while also utilizing some design cues Bungie made for the Spartans in Halo Reach. I mean, you know better than anyone, Mjolnir armor weighs almost a ton. I believe yep. 800 pounds is what they specifically said. Yeah, it's pretty... Basically, the armor's super heavy and Spartans they weren't but that's why they're genetically modified. So yeah, they well, they try to have that. regular Marines who were just slightly modified put them on at first, and then and it's, it would no. broke it broke their bodies. It basically well, it's like them. the scene in Iron Man two when the suit yeah. does a one eighty and For, breaks uh, the guy's spine. What's it, what, uh, what's the dude's name? Hammer Armor. Yeah, Hammer Industries. Yeah. It's basically it basically that happened for yeah, a while. It made it was like, we in, need genetically yeah, modified since the Spartans were genetically modified, their bones instead of changing the armor, they changed humans. Yeah, the bones because were that is grafted with approach. a certain metal or whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. Basically, they did it. And if read read the Fall of Reach, they that scene where they <laughs> put on the first gen Mjolnir armor is actually really cool. Well, that's why they turned it into like an exosuit. Also, yeah, exactly. It's like, well, we want this to work with normal people. Yep, and. So yeah, they, they did try it. to, like, change the armor that. to fit the normal people, but then they're like, yep. the utility and mobility of this specific type of armor can't be beat. Yeah. But yeah, like, that's but that's why you saw redesigns for Master Chief is because they it was all about unifying the lore and the books and everything. So instead of, even though he goes to sleep in Halo 3 wearing one piece of armor oh, and he wakes up in another piece of armor. Did you see what they said? How why no. it did that? So no. apparently, Cortana, like Cortana the entire yeah, like, Cortana the entire time was using micro something. Because she says like fixed I made the upgrades. armor. Yeah, it fixed the armor and made upgrades to. So that was their way of retconning. In it's like why not just have a how scene? He changed why, it. Wouldn't it be funny if the opening of Halo Four was him in the Halo Three armor, and then when he gets to like when he meets up with the Infinity, they have hey we have some new armor for you. Let's 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 upgrade. Oh, I right? know like that. Like and, that would have at least made like that would have yeah. made more sense for like okay if you're gonna redesign the because they redesigned the Mjolnir armor multiple times throughout Bungie you know well, at the so beginning it wasn't of Halo 2 yeah you, it wasn't unheard of to, for Chief to change armor yeah so and, it's like they, they had an easy yeah. way of doing that it's like instead they had to do the weird like I don't know yeah anyway in fact, a lot of the pieces of Halo underwent some massive redesigns for Halo 4. The game's story was to be heavily based on the series' forerunner race, so the architecture of the world and the art design was pivoted to reflect that, much to the dismay of a lot of the fans. A lot of people feel like the art direction has yes. changed for the worse Dipped. after Bungie. I completely agree. But uh, like 343 had an interesting explanation. Is They said like the reason we went this way is because we wanted it to feel almost like it's in the extended universe, so it's like... Yeah. But that's almost a weird way of admitting that you don't want your games to be treated like canon. <laughs> but, whatever. Um, a lot of Halo's artistic direction was changed by 343, not just the art design. The story was also a radical new direction for Halo. <sighs> this is where I'm gonna get a little cynical. 343 was borderline obsessed, just watch one of their behind the scenes docs, with humanizing Master Chief and telling what they felt was a uniquely human story that encouraged human growth. Meanwhile, if we flash back to Bungie, the team that created him saw Chief as pretty much nothing more than an avatar that let players do badass stuff as a character who was capable of doing badass stuff. And I get in the lore that in the books, he's definitely a character, but like we, we discussed this before the show. I feel like that's what made the book so special is that you see him be a character. You see him be the human, but you still yeah. get that he's a hulking badass. And like part of the character is that he is this 
inhuman shell in a way. Exactly. Like he is just so dehumanized because he is literally my existence is to win is to fight for the UNSC. Well, and, so and like, in the books too, they explain that they're like they didn't revere the Spartans as regular humans I know, like, like the Marines. Like they, For sure. Like he had they have elements to the chief and other Spartans. They were seen as like battlefield assets. Yeah, but that's the thing is like, you know, and the Spartans weren't even meant to be, you know, they were there to go out and like you said, the whole thing is, you know, they were missing in action, not dead, because it's yeah. They were meant to be, like you said, like the original games, hope and like that yeah. they could win and stuff like that. Like yeah. I, you didn't There's have a to lot go of into, like legend behind yeah, them. You didn't have to go Myth. into the depths. They were very mythological of figures. Them being Oh yeah, he's a human. Like he's he has his human flaws yeah. and parts. The idea it's was like, that they were greater than humans. Yeah, but but that's thing. It's like the dude's a hulking machine who is a yeah. killing machine, like the Doom guy. Like yeah, you don't have to go super in depth into that. And, they're and, they're no different than like military hardware, like a tank, like exactly. a scorpion in that world. Like that's what they're seen as within the UNSC almost. Exactly. You don't need a human aspect to that which but like, I get I they get, tried like, that might not make for an interesting story yeah but I feel like with Halo that's not the point that's not how you make an interesting story in Halo because like I would say that in Halo 3 you have a very interesting story yeah but it's based on the characters around Chief not Chief himself which is fine because you don't need the Chief to be a human person make the people around him like you said human like and they try that in 4 they have yeah. like Lasky and you know whatever and like some of them they have some interesting characters they in, have some good characters in Halo 4 granted but I'll, I'll talk about this later they kind of have a lot of like artificial drama too oh yeah also for the record take a shot every time you hear the world human and the behind the scenes docs you'll probably die of alcohol poisoning. Love that. Let's do it. <laughs> Cortana needed to be more human. Chief needed to be more human. Their conflicts needed to be more human. I feel like this is extremely evident in the fact that a lot of the conflict in Halo 4, aside from fighting the Prometheans in the Covenant, comes from Master Chief's conflict with the UNSC over what to do with Cortana and his role as a bit of a relic. I actually kind of like the idea of like, dude, You've been missing for years. We've moved on. And then he shows up again. It's like, uh, what do we do with you? Like, that's an interesting story, I guess. But I felt like they went way too hard on that. Yeah. Because, like, you have that one asshole captain dude who's, like, always before yelling at Lasky. Chief. Yeah. Not Lasky. No, before like, Lasky. It was the commander yeah. before Lasky of the yeah. infant. Because Lasky's, like, Chief's bro. But then you have that, like, Greyheart. Like, he looks like Peter Stormare. But, yeah. Like, budget and he Peter was Stormare. like, well, he was basically like, dude, the Spartan 2s are obsolete. Like, Spartan fours are where, where but it's like, at now. That's where I come down. Like I, I read, like the human conflict feels a bit artificial at times. Um, just because like it feels like this guy is just yelling at Chief and mad at him for no reason. It's like, dude, this is Master Chief. He wouldn't do what he does for no reason. Yeah, you know. So it's like, why, why are we having a drama? Why are we having drama here? Chief should outrank all of you, just yeah. in terms of like prestige of experience. Um, it's like in uh, uh, in in the Clone Wars, in the <laughs> for in the Clone Wars movie, basically where yeah. Rex is like, you know, Ahsoka's like, well, I technically outrank you. He's like, yeah, but in my book, experience outranks, you know. Well, it's like Chief literally saved, day. destroyed like three Halos and. You know, he saved, saved humanity multiple, multiple times. times. Like, you dude know, deserves respect. Yeah, pretty much like created peace between the covenant and humans. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I felt like the conflict in Halo Four was a little artificial. It's like they're just doing it because they need drama and storytelling. Yep. Especially because like we're dealing with the Prometheans and the Covenant right now. We do not have time f to get mad at Master Chief because he wants to save Cortana from rampancy. Like, let's just can we just. Ah, stop fighting. Yeah. But, uh... It was forced. Anyway, yeah. It felt like a very forced conflict. Yep. The main enemies of Halo 4 are what are known as the Prometheans, a concept that was originally created by Bungie as part of Peter Jackson's planned Halo Chronicles episodic series of games that was ultimately canceled, as we described last episode. 343's Prometheans are essentially forerunners and reclaimers synthesized into AI and then given a new physical body, but what you really need to know is that they explode and dissolve whenever you kill them, which 343 thought was really cool. You listen to the docs and they're like, I think we found how we make the Prometheans fun to fight. They oh, dissolve God. when you shoot them. It's like, <laughs> all right. And they teleport and it's like, okay. Because, like, Bungie's design philosophy is, like, we need to make enemies that are fun to shoot and fun to be shot at. I will say this now. And out of all the bad guy types, out of the Covenant, out of the Flood, and out of the Prometheans, I hate the Prometheans the most. They're just so boring. They are, and they're annoying as hell. Like, like the Flood scared uh, the shit out of you, and, like... The Flood can get annoying. Yeah, 
but the, but Prometheans, the Prometheans are annoy- annoying and boring. Yeah, it's just because they're like, just not ugh. interesting. Like you said, they just tried too hard. Yeah, they, I I heard someone describe this about Halo's story, and I it makes so much sense. Is that three four three's Halo games have the most story, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have good story. There's a lot of story. But it's not good. <laughs> you yeah. know? It's like there's a lot. They always try to make everything super complicated and whatever. But it's like Bungie did half put like half the effort in, but they did it smarter. And so it's better. Yeah. Like they didn't talk. They showed. Exactly. Like the, the personality came through with like the animation and the visual design and whatever. Or then you look at the Prometheans and they're just these orange and silver robot dudes. It's like, okay, where's the personality in this? Exactly. Whereas you have the brutes and they're like giant monkey things. And then you have the elites and they, even the elites are like so ex- expressive. Oh yeah. And they talk to each other and all that. And the Prometheans are just these silent aggressors. They do actually talk. I know. Like, but it's but just, not like, it's like, you don't hear an elite yelling at a grunt like for robots. being an idiot. And yeah. you don't have grunts being like, oh my God, he's going to kill me. Yeah. You know? I mean, they do have Covenant in 4, but... But, yeah. If at any point when discussing Halo 4 and 5, I sound super cynical, just know that, yes, I am when it comes to 343's games. But, for the record, I do like Halo 4. It's just, the more you think about it and read about it, the more you realize just how ill-conceived and overthought so many of the ideas they had for 4, Halo 4 really are. Like we just described, it's like, there's more, but it's not necessarily better. (laughs) Exactly. And mine, I feel the same as Wade as well, too. So... We are yeah, it's both like, equal in I this thought. Halo 4 is good, but compared to Bungie's games, it's still like, psh, get out of here, you know? It's still bottom tier. Yeah. Again, like, I, I bought Halo 4 when it came out. Same. I got the midnight played release. played it and enjoyed it. Yep. I don't talk, I don't touch on multiplayer in this much. That multiplayer in Halo 4 got a lot of criticism, just because yeah. it's very Call of Duty. The map yep. design, loadouts. Gameplay. Yeah. yeah. They tried way too hard. Again, like, oh, I think I actually touched on this later, like... But I might talk, just say it now, like how I talk about how Halo Reach felt inspired by Call of Duty in like a good way, how like aesthetically, because you're in the military kind of more, and so it kind of feels a bit more like a military shooter. But Halo 4 feels like Call of Duty, it just feels like Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. You know, if, it's very surface level influence. But Halo 4 would eventually come out in late 2012, but before its launch, a mini series called Halo 4 Forward Unto Dawn aired on Halo Waypoint and Machinima, rest in peace, set 31 years before the events of Halo 4. And so we begin yet another long-winded saga of live-action projects set in the Halo universe, but we'll get more into that next time. Did you watch Unto Dawn? I don't really want to get into it that much. I did. did you watch? Um, I didn't think it was bad. I, it's a fun watch. If you like I've, Halo, I've, I've, yeah, I've heard it's, it's a fun just, watch. I've heard it's serviceable. Yes. It's, if you like Halo, you'll like it. Yep. Halo 4 was released on November 6, 2012 to solid critical reception and over $300 million in sales during its first week on sale. Even though Bungie was no longer in the picture, Halo was still stronger than ever. Halo 4 outperformed Halo Reach, which really hurts to say. <laughs> Yeah. But this kind of, what I'm about to say next really good, drives home what I said about Reach, how it was kind of like Halo on the way out. Even with Halo 4's great sales, it was still only the second best-selling game of that November, not even the year, just that month. Getting beat by, guess who? Call of Duty Black Ops 2, which is a fantastic game, by the way. Halo Black Ops 2 is a better game than Halo 4. I'll say it. I don't think I that's, agree. I, I don't think that's a hot take. I don't think, I, I honestly don't think Call of Duty Black Ops or Call of Duty Black Ops 2 isn't one of my favorite CODs but for most people it is and I still think it's yeah. better than Halo people 4 people love I almost like to a point I don't understand people yeah. love Black Ops 2 but Black Ops 2 is still like one of the best Call of Duty games I think yeah Um. but yeah Uh. like I said this, the Call of Duty's influence on Halo was more apparent than ever with Halo 4 it had QTEs scripted set pieces you had those climbing sections which felt super out of place yeah and it's not like other Halo games like didn't have set pieces, but set pieces in Halo games previously, like in Halo 3, was, oh no, there's two scarabs, now what do we do? You know, like that's the set pieces, they're throwing a lot at you and it's how do you handle that? Whereas in Halo 4, it's the control is taken away from you and you watch a cutscene that's from... Chief's it's like in game, yeah, in Chief's perspective. It's the same thing in like Call of Duty 4, or, 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 or I mean, in Call of Duty, you know, like when you watch the Eiffel Tower fall down and Modern Warfare 3 or whatever, you know, it's 
it's a cutscene you're watching. Yeah, it feels like, like you're doing something, but you're not. You're just in, and en- it's an in-engine cutscene that you can control yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Whereas Halo Three and like Halo set pieces before that really felt like this is a cinematic set pieces yeah. that you have control over, like. That two scarab, like the two scarab part in Halo Three, how you can they give you a cliff that you can drive a warthog off of off onto of the scarab. One. You don't yeah. have to do that, but you can. It's yeah. there. That's how you do it in Halo. Also, hey, in Halo Four, sprinting is now a fundamental part of gameplay, which we talked, which touched on a little bit. Yep. And so began Three Four Three's journey with Halo. And regardless of how we feel about Halo Four and what we thought it did well or what it did poorly, it was still a very great success for Microsoft and very reassuring that they made the right decision in regards to um, 343 and continuing the Master Chief saga. Conceptually twisted, just misunderstood, I think Halo 4 might just be the most divisive entry in the Halo series, but for understandable reasons. Halo 5 might get that honor, but I feel like the response to Halo 5 is more negative than positive, so it's hard to call it divisive when (laughs) more people... More people lean toward negative than positive, whereas I feel like Halo 4 has like an even split of haters and defenders. But what was next? Microsoft had a ton of ideas in the bank, spin-offs, re-releases, adaptations, major entries. But for those, we would have to wait for a new generation of Xbox hardware and for a new episode of Random Access Memories. Next time, we'll discuss Halo's role on the Xbox One as well as the future of the series. Next week, it's the finale of the complete story of Halo, and I hope you join us as we finish the fight. See you next time. Later. Thank you for listening to Random Access Memories, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want more, check out our previous episodes and or subscribe to the show on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast was produced by Ron's Pies on YouTube, so please check